thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, you join me as I uh, welcome a very well-known face, particularly to fans of ITV's Poirot. Uh, he is uh, very well known as Assistant Commissioner Jap, or Assistant Commissioner in 2013, but we know him mainly as Chief Inspector Jap. He is, of course, Philip Jackson. Philip, thank you for joining me. It's a great pleasure. Nice to talk to you. Uh, and and how, uh, how are you doing in these slightly odd times? Are you all right? Uh, going a little bit crazy, actually. But, you know, actors spend a lot of time when they're not actually working. So we're quite used to it, amusing ourselves. And I'm not, I'm not bad at that. I'm actually quite good at being at home and uh, finding things to do. So it's, it's not completely unusual. What, what is unusual is the lack of social um dealings with people you know just going to like restaurants and pubs and like meeting friends and doing all that that's that that's what's really hard but no we're all right we you know we read loads of books here we watch quite a lot of stuff on tv and uh video and all that kind of stuff and we've got a nice garden we're very lucky i feel sorry for people who you know uh, in flats with no garden and that must be hard but we, we're quite lucky in that respect well, it is good to see you doing so well. You certainly look well, so it's good, good <laughs> and, uh, and very reassuring, very reassuring. Um, so I have a bit of a chat with you today. Uh, as you know, the subject is uh, Agatha Christie on TV. Um, and mm. we know, as I said earlier, we know you from Poirot. But taking yeah. a step much further back than that, much further back than that, uh, was acting always something uh, in your blood? Was it always something you wanted to, to be a part of? Um, I wouldn't say that, really. I think... Um... I was at uh, a grammar school in uh, Nottinghamshire, I'm from a place called Retford in Nottinghamshire, quite a small town. And at school, I always thought that the people who are involved in the um, amateur dramatics at uh, school were really not my type. They seemed a bit a bit snooty and a bit, uh, you know, <laughs> didn't really welcome you in there. Well, so I, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't really relate to them. But <clears throat> we were at, uh, I was in the choir at our local church and we decided we were going to put some plays on in the youth club. And there was a woman who came in, Ella Livingston, the doctor's wife, came in <clears throat> uh, to do these productions. And she was rather inspiring. So was, I kind of got into it. And it was the 1960s and people were find, trying to find some way of avoiding conventional work, avoiding mm. you know, getting up up at the same time every morning and going into work. And I suddenly thought, oh, I rather like this and I'll pursue it. And I went to um, I went to university in Bristol and I read drama as joint, in a joint degree. Uh, not, not necessarily thinking I was going to be an actor, but just thought I'd like to get into that world, maybe as a director or in some other way. But then I did a lot of plays while I was there and thought, hmm, maybe I'll give this a go. Uh, so I did. <laughs> <laughs> did you have any formal training at all? Did you take it further than, than that at that stage? Uh, no, I mean, the drama department at Bristol was quite uh, academic, quite literary. I mean, we, we learned a lot about plays uh, as literature. But, but then we did a bit of practical stuff, like uh, on the technical side, not just the acting. Like, I mean, the first week we were there I think they taught me how to use a washing machine because that's <laughs> useful if you're in the wardrobe department very true like very true <laughs> yeah yeah but there were some good people then but it was just in a lot of plays so when it came to finishing the three years there I sort of didn't want to be an, a, a student anymore so I wrote lots of letters and managed to get a job in rep in rep theatre at Liverpool and um so I don't I don't, I don't want to go to drama school I don't want to be a student anymore you know so that I, think, was that. I think a lot of actors um, now, uh, I think, I, and I think from what I've heard, quite rightfully, uh, think that the the loss of the the rep system really is a, a huge loss mm. altogether to both theatre and to, to television, as it was in itself uh, an education. Did you find that? Yeah, I mean, if you're starting out today, it's very different from when I started out. I'll tell you, and I think it must must be much more difficult. I mean, there were virtually every town of any decent size in England and Wales and Scotland come to that had had a, a rep theatre mm. I mean I went mm. to Liverpool I was there for 18 months I didn't play very big parts at the beginning I was like stage management 
stroke actor and did small parts to begin with. In fact, my first job on the first morning I arrived was fishing dead rats out of a flooded basement backstage because there was a coal <laughs> store in Williamson Square in Liverpool and there was a coal store which had been demolished nearby and uh, there were a lot of rats running around and a lot of them got drowned in the, in the theatre. <laughs> so Good grief. The glamour, glamour of it was... I was going to say, well, it's... <laughs> yeah. That's great. It's, ones, it's, yeah. What I'm saying is, I mean, I stayed there 18 months and put a play on every three weeks. Mm. It wasn't always... A very high standard maybe but just to have that amount of time being in the theater and being with uh, professionals and all that you just learn so much and kids can't do that these days when they're coming out they're going to go straight for tv and film and i don't know i mean i don't know how you'd approach it and also fringe theater there was much more fringe theater in london especially around that time so you could go and do plays and not be paid for them necessarily but just get experience learn how to do it learn how who you are and how you relate to it you know yeah 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 a very a very solid grounding how did you make that step from from theater into television uh well <laughs> it was a bit of a fluke to be yeah. honest because a friend of mine who i'd known when i was a student it was simon masters really clever guy actually um still still around um had written two novels before he was like 16 years old really clever guy wow he then yeah he, he then went to work at the bbc as a script editor and he'd heard in the corridors of uh, television center that somebody was doing a play for today a one-off drama uh which was set in nottinghamshire um and he knew that I was from Nottinghamshire, so they wouldn't get the right accents and all that. And uh, I got the job. I went to see the guy. It was actually directed by James Furman, who later became the film censor. I don't know whether you knew that. Uh, very gifted guy. And I wow. played a, a Nottinghamshire miner. And uh, I got the job just because he tipped me off that, you know, it was a possibility. It's often the way, I, though, isn't it? Mm, yes, it's true. And I mean, the BBC at that time, in a way, was England's film industry because lots of directors, people like Mike Lee, Stephen Frears, Ken Loach, were actually working on television drama, particularly at the BBC. So the sort of one-off um, drama things that were going on mm. were, were phenomenal, you know, really, really good stuff. They don't do that so much these days. That's another reason that I think it's hard. So no, absolutely. It, it it really was. It was a uh, like you say, yeah. anthology series and those one-off dramas, and though again, a real uh, a real boon for for actors. Um, yeah. One of which, actually, very early on, uh, I know you were involved in, was called Dial M for Murder back in 1974. <laughs> so you had uh, right. you, you already had uh, you know the 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 murder mystery thing uh, down pat in 1974. Do you remember anything about that? What are your memories of working on it? <laughs> I, I don't remember a great deal about it, to be honest, but I think I was assistant uh, detective, like investigator mm. to a wonderful actor called Ronald Hines, who was my boss. And Ronald Fraser, I don't know if you remember an actor called Ronald yes, Fraser. Yes, yes, Very distinguished actor at the time. He uh, he was in this, um, in this, and I... I, I, I don't remember it too well, you can <laughs> tell. It was, uh, it was a lot of drama going on at the BBC mm. at that time. <laughs> mm. Mm. You know, both both so. on and off screen, no doubt. Um, Very much so. But I mean, you don't seem to have stopped. I think the word prolific could have been invented for you, having a look at so yeah. many credits and really big things. You've got Coronation Street, uh, things like Cat's Eyes. Uh, the other thing I noticed on your CV is the, the chat with the spanner in the AHA Take On Me video. In which ah. I, in which I understand you only appear as an illustration. Did you actually film anything for it? No, we did. We did film it. We actually filmed it in the normal, the normal manner of um, as, as you would normally. But as you know, in in that, if most people are familiar with it. It's a very famous um, thing. Uh, like the filming was then. Um, converted in a very clever way into a cartoon and it mm. kind of zigzagged in and out of cartoon stuff so we did actually film it and then and I think there are, is a point when you see our real images very momentarily yeah we going absolutely to that was a chap uh, Steve Barron who became uh, the king of uh, 
pop promo yeah. videos uh, in the 80s and, well, we had the 90s as well, I suppose. I played five-a-side football with him at the Sobel Centre up in Islington when he was a young lad. Uh, his <laughs> mum was a very, very good uh, film uh, director and producer called Zelda Baron. Uh, and he was working really on the technical side and he started making these videos and then he just asked me to do it. Mm. I later worked with him on Mike Bassett, England Manager. Yes. Film Ricky Tomlinson as uh, England Manager. Actually, ah, I believe on TV later this week, actually. Yeah, and 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 very funny it is too. I remember I remember it at the time. As a, yeah, as, a as a denizen of Norwich, we're all very well aware that none of it was actually filmed in Norwich. But you know that's a that's something I have to let go after all these years. <laughs> I know it's very hard. Yes, it, well, that's right. Norwich was uh, figured highly, didn't it? But we never went anywhere near it. Never, never. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to bring it round to the point that we are here yeah. to talk about Poirot. Um, yeah. You know, uh, uh, it, it's a vast catalogue of work starting back in 1989 and you were on board uh, there from day one as far as those episodes go. Uh, the Adventure of Clapham Cook, the very first one. Uh, uh, what, how did you become involved in the, in the project itself to start with? Um, the beginning of Poirot was, began just as virtually everything else an actor does. It began in the same way, I just got a call saying, oh, they're making this series about based on uh, Hercule Poirot stories as a part of the uh, chief inspector in it. Would you go along and meet the director and the producer? And, you know, I, I, I can't remember whether I had to read, often you have to read a couple of scenes to see what they sound like. Mm. Uh, I think I probably, I can't really remember. Um, and I don't know, I seem to hit the right spot. Uh, so yeah. I was on board very quickly. I mean, it, it, it was pretty, it, I didn't go through a, like a long uh, process, you know, there weren't lots of meetings and will it happen or won't it? Um, it, it seemed to happen quite easily. Uh, I must have got the right, right look at the time. Absolutely. And founded right for what, what, what they had in mind. I, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, when they, we had no idea, of course, that it would, uh, go on and for quite as long as it has and, and be as successful. It was, it was another job, really. Of, of course. I mean, that's what I was going to say. When you first started, did you have any inkling um, at any stage that it would run for as long as it has? No, I don't think we did. I mean, when we were filming it, it was pretty clear that um, the production values are very high because it's set in the 1930s. Mm. Uh, the design of it, you know, the art department, and really a lot of money was spent on the screen to make it look good. And I think that really has been part of its success because that they were meticulous and the, the, the detail is, is really phenomenal. And also, it has to be said, David Suchet brought a lot of gravity and care to the role. He, he didn't mess about. He, he really had gone into it in great detail and came up with something that lots of people would say is, is pretty definitive. So it, it was quality work. You knew it was quality work. And that's exactly, I was going to, I was going to mention your, 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 your fellow actors, uh, David hmm. Suchet, Hugh Fraser, Pauline Moran. Yeah. Part of that, did it feel like, again, was it, once you got settled in and you're working with these people very regularly, did it almost feel again, like being back in that kind of theater ensemble, kind of cast yeah it, it, it did feel like an ensemble and uh, we we were a little family it, it was like you know i mean they they got very good actors to come in to play guest roles and the roles were pretty good pretty meaty but you knew by the quality of actor who was coming in that they respected it and respected us and yeah we, we were a good group we were a good little group and spent a lot of time together <laughs> as you know yes absolutely yeah, Hugh, Hugh Fraser, I mean, I'm still friends with all of them, but Hugh Fraser and I are particularly close, and we, uh, we continued that relationship. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. That's good to know. That's good to know. Mm. Um, you, you're in, I mean, there's, a, there's, there's a, an awful lot of episodes. You're in 40 of them alone. Um, I mean, looking, yeah. looking back, um, has it felt... Has it felt, I mean, it's a, it's a very, it's many, many years. Has it felt like all of those years or has it just been kind of so fun that, that, that it's flown by when you've been working on these? 
Oh, it's flown by. And I mean, we didn't work on it all the time. When we first started, I think we spent probably six months <clears throat> doing the one hour ones because the first mm. three years was just the one hour episodes, which we did 10, I think. So the other half of the year, you did other things if you, if you could. Um, so it didn't feel like it completely dominated your life. But we didn't know it would go on for so long. And once they started doing the two hour episodes, you maybe wouldn't be working for quite so many weeks. And actually in the middle of it, there was a five year gap. Yes. Um, can't remember which years exactly. <laughs> uh, and then of course, when we got to the, um, <clears throat> the 2000 and the producer changed and all that, and, the, and the, our characters weren't in them for the episodes for quite a long time until right mm. at the end. Then that was a very big gap. <laughs> when you returned to the role after all those years, quite a, it's quite a gap between uh, between the, the, the two visits to the character. Uh, did you find it difficult to to become Jap once again? It, it was it was very strange coming back because I think we finished in two thousand. You know the regular run of it mm. uh, after what on and off for like twelve years or something. Yes, yeah. And then we didn't come back to it, although they carried on it without our characters. They did stories that our characters weren't in, basically. Mm. Um, 2013, I think it yes. was? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's a really long time. Mm. And it, it was easy to go back into the character, I think, because we'd done it for so long. But we were older, and, we were, and I'd become, Jack had become assistant commissioner. Absolutely. Was no longer just the chief inspector. So that there was something different about the relationship because of that. But probably the main thing was that um, the sort of family of people who worked on it, like the tech, the technicians, you know, the camera and the props and the lighting and all the people in the costume and makeup who worked on it, we didn't know. So it was like there wasn't that history with them. Yes, they, they'd had it with David on his own, with David Suchet on his own but they hadn't had it with us. So the atmosphere wasn't the same. It wasn't as it had been because we'd mm. sort of grown up with it a bit, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you, you talked there about developing the character at that point. How, if you, if you could go back to that, that start point in 1989 uh, and mm. know for how long it would have, if, if on day one they'd said, oh, by the way, by the way, you'll still be filming this in 2013, would you have approached it any differently? <laughs> if we know if we known it would go on that long i think we would have probably it would probably have affected us in a bad way because we mm. might have got a bit a bit lazy i mean actors are quite paranoid and <laughs> that we don't really don't know even when you're at a much higher level than i am uh where your next job's coming from mm. so that would slightly affect you know i've never had a had the Inkly under the yearning really to be in a long running soap, you know, and yep. want to know, oh, that's what you'll be doing this time next year. I never wanted that. I like the idea that you don't know what's going to happen. So I think yep. it changes your um, your energy and your sort of need, if that makes any sense. You know. yeah. but no, uh, we have uh, no it, idea that it would last so long. Yeah, yeah. I suppose I suppose it would entirely, yeah, like you say, change your hmm. change your approach to how you feel about being in in work steady work steady-ish work for as, yes. for as long yes. as that would it yeah. maybe have changed your approach to the character do you think do you think would you have, would you have, i don't know fleshed it out more done done something else with it well i suppose that you, because you're doing it over several years it, it changes and your attitude to it changes there was always a thing about that relationship between uh, jack and poirot that i think in the past it's been done that Jack is just a sort of buffoon and he's not really very bright at all. And that, you know, Poirot always gets it right and Jack gets it wrong. But we, we didn't want to make it just as black and white as that. I think Jack was a, an honourable man who did mm. his best and he was, had a morality about him and a seriousness about doing the job, which Poirot actually admires. And although he hasn't got the imaginative sense that Poirot has, he's got a solid attitude to the job that kind of comes through and I think as that went on that kind of mutual respect thing maybe became a bit important because we've been through a lot together on and off screen you know yeah absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. how well uh how well did you know 
Poirot or indeed the work of Agatha Christie prior to taking on the job? Right, well, I'd, I'd certainly read a lot of the books when I was, you know, still at school, mm. maybe, you know, um, and so, I mean, I liked them a lot. Um, my kind of um, uh, way of doing it is not, not the same as David's. He, 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 I think, read every book there is and wanted to use everything that he, he read to like create his character. I didn't feel the need to do that, I must say. I'd mm. kind of took it more off the script rather than off the novels. But obviously, if anything went against what she, Agatha had written, then we, we'd yeah. soon know about it. But we, yes. we, were very for, yeah, we, we were very fortunate early on that um, the writer called Clive Exton did uh, a lot of the adaptations of the books, and he had a bit of a he, he had a bit of a liking for uh, Chief Inspector Jap. So he <laughs> did invent quite a lot of stuff. I mean, there was one episode I can't remember which episode it was where Poirot actually visits Jap at his home in Isleworth, and Jap comes up with a, 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 um, a dinner. You know, very. <laughs> not, yes. certainly not the sort yes. of dinner that Clara's used to so there's a lot of comedy in that and a comedy about Mrs Jap who you never actually see but gets talked about a lot I don't yeah. think that that's in that all that stuff's in the books but we were allowed we had to run everything past Agatha Christie's estate you know mm -hmm. they're very on it and wouldn't permit anything that didn't um, fit in with the ethos of the books you know oh, uh, but that helped me a lot because there was a writer like around who was fond of him and like wrote definite things, you know. No, that's great. I think it's it's a very different thing, isn't it? A book is a book and an adaptation is an adaptation. Now you don't want to mm -hmm. veer too far off it, but television is setting out to to do to tell a story in a very different way. So actually I think yeah. it's great that you had someone as, as sympathetic to the character as that. Um did you find that that sort of stood you in good stead as you went on? Yeah, I think so, because you knew that um you know, the people people writing scripts are actually on, appreciative of what you're doing, and and you've got you know you're on the same singing from the same hymn sheet. But I mean, that's no wasn't trying to go against what what she wrote in the novel. So mm. and I think what we did was very much in the spirit of it, and I think that's why it's been so popular. There have been certain uh, adaptations uh, recently of some of her stuff that's probably veered a long way away from traditionally what what people want from an Agatha Christie thing and I don't think that it, that's been terribly successful uh, what I've seen I've seen much, people you know. people have it people have it very dear to their hearts um, I've hmm. really enjoyed some of the recent adaptations simply because we have other adaptations we can go and look at. So actually, yeah. as a chance to move away from the, the source, so to speak, um, I suppose you can play with it now. There have been fairly faithful adaptations. Maybe it's time to, to look differently, yeah. but I don't think that would, would have worked for, uh, for the lovely Poirot. Like you said, uh, mm -hmm. David is, is the definitive Poirot. I think that, yeah. will, always, I think that will always be the case. Um, that said, had you seen anyone else in the role on screen, um, Peter Ustinov, for example? I'd seen Ustinov, yeah. And um, uh, I don't know whether you know this, but um, David Suchet played Jap in, in a film of uh, th 13 at Dinner, it was called. I think it's based on Lord Edgware Dies. Mm. Uh, and he played Chief Inspector Jap. And he, if you ask him about it, he'll say that he's not very proud of it because he thinks he... And it's, it was updated to the 1970s, of course, which takes away a lot of the mystery of the yeah. 1930s and all that. Yeah. But he, he played uh, Jap. I have seen it a long time ago. And he had a sort of footballer's sheepskin coat on. And if there was any food anywhere in a room that he went into, he immediately started eating. <laughs> well, that's not in the books. Definitely. So he, um, I don't know, he, he, I think he thinks that I was a bit more uh, like Jap <laughs> naturally than, than he was. Absolutely um, right. And, and I, I think he probably is right. I think he probably is right. He's, <laughs> he's probably more suited to the, the Poirot role than the Jap role, I would, from my personal a, point of view. <laughs> listen, he's a lot more, he's a lot more like Poirot in real life than I would ever be. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, I'm probably more like Jack. <laughs>
than he would ever be. So. Yeah, there we go. You see, this is, yeah. a, this, is, this, is, this is the joy of acting. Now, listen, before yeah. we go, I, I do have one question. It's a very simple yeah. question for oh. me to ask. I don't know how simple it is for you to answer. Do you have a favourite story within, within all of those 40 episodes in which you appeared? Do you have a favourite? Is there one that stands out for you? You mean uh, with a favourite episode? Well, favourite favourite story that you took part in, one of those. <laughs> I should have a, 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 a nice list of uh, anecdotes from on the set, shouldn't I, at this point? And then my <laughs> mind's gone absolutely blank. I mean, certainly the episode I, I like the most, the adaptation I like the mm. most is ABC Murders, yeah. which I see recently got voted by the public, I think, on ITV3. Uh, to be their favourite episode, and they showed indeed. it. Indeed, really, it did. I, I didn't indeed, know that it was did. Coming, but <clears throat> I think I think that one just just works on all levels. The kind of pace of the story and the characters and the period and all that sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, there were definitely um, amusing incidents when when we did the um, episode. I think it's no, wait a minute. I think it's called the Chocolate Box which was set in Belgium. We went to Belgium and Jap received an award from the yes. Belgian police force. Now, I think <laughs> that was Clive Exon again. I don't think it's uh, Christy, but it might be mentioned. I don't know. Uh -huh. But we came back from lunch one day in the, uh, the, the, the great town hall, the Hotel de Ville, the Grand Place in, in Brussels, in the, where I received this award. Wonderful. And the entire crew had decked themselves out in Jap moustaches. <laughs> oh, came in. Oh, everybody. that's wonderful. And it was absolutely amazing. I got a photograph somewhere of it. And <laughs> I just that's thought that, that is really something. That I mean, lovely. They were celebrating the fact that he was getting an award, which obviously he never, never did normally. <laughs> so, that, that was something. <laughs> That's nice. That's nice. That's really yeah, good. I, I have to say, they, they didn't try uh, to get themselves all into a Poirot style moustache. <laughs> that would have been a bit more of a challenge. That, that would have taken considerably more time, I strongly suspect. <laughs> And a lot Certainly more moustache wax. I mean, it really would. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So overall, it sounds like it was an incredibly positive job, a really uh, good thing to be involved in. Would you change anything about your time on Poirot at all? No, I don't, no, certainly not. It was, it, was a, it was a great journey, and it came at a very good time in all our lives, in all our stages of our career to do something that became that commercial and just good. people knew about you more because of mm -hmm. it you know I'd done a lot I'd done quite a lot of TV before that as you know and yeah it tended to be not ultra commercial it was slightly more edgy some slightly alternative stuff yes yeah some of it not all of it but uh you know so yeah no it was good it was great came at the right time and we had a lot of fun. It absolutely sounds like it. And from what we've seen on screen, uh, myself and I would imagine almost all of the viewers wouldn't change a thing about it. So I would like to say, Philip Jackson, a huge thank you uh, for all the episodes and all the lovely times you've given us watching. And also a massive thank you for joining me today. It's really kind of you. Nice. It's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> lovely stuff. Thank you. Take care okay. and we'll catch up soon. Cheers. All right. Bye for now. Bye bye. bye. I said, I'll tell you what I should have said about any, uh, the, one, the one slight regret after it. I should say maybe it was a slight regret that Jack didn't get his own spin-off series. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now that would have been good. If they, can do it, if they can do it for the Morse characters. Well, there you go. There you it's go. Never, it's never too late. <laughs> <laughs>